to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your Peptide Buddy. Hey everybody, so multiple people have expressed an interest in learning more about growth hormone itself. We've talked immensely about the clinical evaluation of growth hormone, popular use context, and of course the many peptides and non-peptide compounds that in some way or another augment growth hormone and IGF-1. Since we always address the risks of such, let's start with that since they're broad and diverse. Let's get from superficial to deep and most concerning, and don't forget this isn't medical advice. I don't know if you saw the big disclaimer in the beginning of the video. First, when some people administer growth hormone, there are several visible features that can present themselves. And when we're talking about GH administration, they're most predominant in the context of overuse. Some of these features include larger facial structure, as well as another that's called palumboism or abdominal hypertrophy, that prominent bulge of the abdomen that can come with prolonged anabolic steroid and HGH use. And while it's not a medical diagnosis per se, it is a commonly observed phenomenon with use of these substances. Other things we worry about when talking talking about otherwise healthy people administering GH are decreases in insulin sensitivity, which can be measured by increased fasting blood glucose and other metrics that indicate features of insulin resistance. GH itself is considered diabetogenic, and although not everybody will develop insulin resistance from growth hormone, as the clinical results are mixed and of note predominantly done in a population of people suffering from GHD or growth hormone deficiency, however, it's a generally discussed concern, and I personally think one that otherwise healthy adults should consider and monitor. On top of that, there's almost a guaranteed likelihood of increased water retention, which can not only affect physical appearance and the scale, but there's a possible effect on blood pressure due to increased peripheral resistance of blood vessels as well as sleep apnea. Another thing we'll touch on is the concern for cancerous growth and spread. Injecting what will become a downstream proponent of growth stimulation given GH's signaled production of IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor 1, there exist concerns for either increased predisposition to cancer formation or quicker worsening of a pre-existing lesion with growth hormone use. And on top of that, increased presence of IGF-1 is correlated with multiple different cancers, so individual medical histories, genetic predispositions, and personal risks for different malignancies, as well as physician oversight, is in my opinion crucial. That said, GAH's direct role in de novo cancer formation appears to be less clear. In summary, as a literature review from the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine states, and I quote, aside from edema, fatigue, arthralgias, and carpal tunnel syndrome, which has also been found in previous reviews, other significant multi-system adverse effects include cardiovascular insults and neuropsychiatric complaints with high-dose regimens. So, Overall, these are a few of the risks that worry me and are worth getting out of the way before we get into HGH as a compound itself, also known as somatropin, which in a clinical context is most frequently used in children and adults diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency, or GHD. The same structure of growth hormone is made synthetically or bioengineered into the same 191 amino acid polypeptide, most oftentimes, and people suffering from GHD and otherwise experimentally inclined healthy individuals injected in various varying dosing regimens. We have ad nauseum discussed the different reasons why people augment growth hormone and the evidence that supports these different things. I encourage you to visit my growth hormone playlist to see these videos which include some deep dives and at times social commentary. This also seems like a good time for a holiday season self plug and to also encourage you to hit that like and subscribe button if you're so inclined. It's single handedly the best way to help me out and while we're at it I conducted a poll since although many people seem to enjoy the jingle at the beginning of these videos others have recently begun to admit distaste and perhaps even hatred. Well, sorry haters, the joyous music adorers have won, and so for now at least, let's keep the jingle. Okay, back to the video. Some of these perceived benefits of growth hormone include improvements in sleep, increases in muscle mass, decreases in fat mass, improvements in recovery and vitality, and although these are popularly controversial topics, most of them are controversial with regards to the literature too. There's no evidence-based peer-reviewed literature that appropriately lends growth hormone use and healthy individuals to muscle gain in the context of fat loss. Yes, some literature suggests that you may be able to gain muscle easier. Others suggest that, yes, there may be decreases in fat mass in people 
exposed to growth hormone use. However, other things play a role, age, weight, exercise, but growth hormone alone will not throw muscle on the body while shedding fat. The scant literature that suggests it may do such a thing labels water retention as a likely reason why lean body metrics may be improved. So yes, people may by definition have improvements in lean body mass. That said, is it due to loss of fat, increased muscle, or the highly predominant side effect of increased edema or water retention that's responsible for that? Some studies indicate that GH administration can increase lean body mass due to water retention rather than actual muscle accrual, which also complicates the interpretation of results. That said, some of these findings are less likely to be seen in people with growth hormone deficiency, where these individuals are more inclined to take on muscle given chronic deficiencies in endogenously functional GH. Regardless, nothing has convincingly shown direct improvements in strength as well. Where I imagine most people anecdotally benefit, although not entirely proven as well, is with regards to muscle recovery, which don't get me wrong, could predispose to an easier time gaining muscle and even strength, and this topic alone has been minimally evaluated. But the extent to which GH use directly ties to muscle mass is, in my opinion, evidently bland and quite likely overhyped. As the same literature review we quoted earlier also states, and I quote, GH administration may lead to changes in body composition, lean body mass, body weight, extracellular water content, fat mass, but it does not seem to increase either muscle strength or improve physical performance in healthy young subjects. So growth hormone is, in my opinion, perhaps not the touted fountain of youth that it's oftentimes claimed to be, but rather maybe even a fountain of speculation. And I hold that decreases naturally in growth hormone as we age may even be protective in nature for a few different reasons. Concerns about cancer, insulin resistance, and perhaps even just due to water retention and heart strain. Though anecdotal reports are widespread, our focus remains on peer-reviewed data, which highlights more than anything and other otherwise healthy adults, not the chronically ill elderly population or the children with growth hormone deficiency, the ambiguity surrounding its administration. And just like the risks are magnified by higher doses, the perceived benefits likely are too, which is important to keep in mind when hearing out the experiences of others. And just to clarify, I'm not thinking in definites here. This is clearly a complex topic, and although recovery makes sense, the component with decent literature surrounding it is for fat loss. That said, these are studied in people who would likely benefit those with growth hormone deficiency, older people, chronically ill. What I'm trying to do is separate healthy adult aged individuals from the rest of the picture, and it's a very, very slim population that had even been studied. Do the same results apply to someone 30 and 70? Possibly, I mean, but pretty unlikely. These unknowns are vastly limiting an ability to draw an all or nothing conclusion about what will happen in this broad and quite nebulous discussion. So does growth hormone improve body mass in some healthy people? Definitely. But does the research convince me that all the body composition improvements are solely or even mostly due to muscle with all this talk about water retention and that is a possible confounder in understanding this? Absolutely. Just to make sure we're on the same page here. The consistent inconsistency not only leads me to believe better long-term risk and benefit studies are needed to be done to assess the utility of growth hormone in an otherwise healthy population of people, but it also makes me doubt the hype of it as a whole. That's where I stand as an obviously hesitant person on an obviously complex topic. It's something I've read a ton about, I've made a lot of videos about it, and still my mind wavers, just like the data. Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts, whether you've read the studies, heard anecdotes, or have personal experiences, or know a friend who does. Leave a comment below, let's keep the discussion evidence-based, and given it's the holidays, respectful. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch. I also want to wish you a happy holiday season. Stay warm, stay safe, and most importantly, thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.